and artists and welcome to another Toon Boom interview. By day, Maria Lassell is a solution specialist at Toon Boom Animation who trains artists and at major studios around the world. Her CV includes animation on Wakfu along with multiple productions roles on Big Hero 6 the series and Glitch Techs. In her spare time, Maria shares animated projects online as The Bird Brain. Maria, welcome to the stream. Hello, it's me. How's it going, Mike? That's going good. So, Maria, what do you have to share with our audience today? Okay, so today what I have to share is an, anim is an animation I made some times ago of a guy running with a cloak on its back. And what we're going to do with it uh, during the, the stream is uh, I'll be looking at it, I'll be answering questions from you guys because you have amazing, amazing questions planned out. And I'll be doing some uh, cleaner drawings on that animation because the rough that we have now is uh, not that clean. <laughs> so, oops, that's not the right one. So I have this rough and I'm going to draw prettier drawings on top of this one. And I'm going to show you some quick tips on how to do that. Yeah, so, so the technique you're using right now, uh, what type of technique is it? It's called frame by frame animation. And oops. It's a technique in which you have to draw your stuff uh, frame by frame in order for it to uh, move. So if I want this cloak to move, you have to draw it frame by frame, and eventually it looks like it moves. <laughs> and Just how many like frames that. per second are you drawing? Uh, I'm drawing 12 frames per second. So, well, I'm animating, it's, it's 24 frames a second, but you know, everybody cheats. So each of these drawings, we make them appear twice. Actually, I'm animating on thirds now, so it's even slower. <laughs> so instead of animating on twos, I'm animating on threes, like that. And uh, what are the different steps in frame-by-frame -frame animation? So the different steps in frame-by-frame -frame animation is usually you'll have the thumbnail, um, Oops, let me just close. You have the thumbnail, uh, which is basically you take your scene. Well, actually, it depends. If you're starting from a storyboard, you're going to look at the storyboard and you're going to animate from it, right? But if you start from your mind, like I did for this thing, uh, usually my first step would be to find some references because it's really important, especially when you're animating cloaks like that. And then as you look at your references, which are on my other monitor, so you cannot see them. But uh, I'll, I'll just go in the margin and just start to sketch from what I see. And it's very, very small sketches. Like the rule is be far away and do these small sketches, just so that you get the shape and strength of that movement. And then when I have my thumbnails uh, animated, for example, if I just make uh, them in the corner of that one, if I animate something, I do them in the corner of my camera just to get my guy running, for example. Just to get the strength in there. And then when I get my thumbnails, I can make them bigger and I start to do the rough. So usually it would be reference, thumbnails, rough animation. After that, you get your tie down, which is what I'm going to do today. And after you get your tie down, you're going to get the final rough, uh, the final clean. Uh, lines that you can then color and composite. So these are all the stages. Yeah. That's a lot so, of so stages. When you're showing me the, oh, when you were showing me the animation uh, earlier, you're showing some of the rough and the uh, the, the tie downs that you're doing. Um, what is really important in rough animation, and what problems are animators trying to solve at this step in production? So usually, what I, ooh, <laughs> this is ugly. <laughs> usually, what I the 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 biggest mistake I see. Uh, when people start out, and it's what I used to do as well when I started out, so no shame. Everybody makes these. Where did you go? Layer. Oh, it's there. It was hiding between its friends. What are you doing, layer? Stop messing around. So I have this layer, and I'm just going to isolate it so that you can see all better. There we go. 
So usually when people animate, they're going to say like, OK, my guy is going to do something. So uh, they're going to have their character standing there. So instead of redrawing, they would just take the last drawing and then copy paste it on the next frame and then maybe take like their cutter tool and be like, yeah, look at that, my arm moved. The problem with that is that it makes everything look stiff. So especially in rough uh, animation, if I go back to my actual rough animation, come back. In rough animation, it's important to keep your things uh, alive and to keep them alive, especially when you're learning, it's good to actually draw your frames. Because if you copy paste too much, this, this is when animation starts to look a bit stiff. What are some ways that you can avoid having your animation look stiff at the rough stage? At the rough stage, to avoid um, me to avoid it looking stiff, I think I think the biggest advice I got within my second year of animation school, wish I got that earlier. Um, our teacher came and he was like, "Okay, uh, to draw now for to to animate, um, I'm gonna teach you how to rough." And he just gave us this amazing. Um, he just gave us this amazing six B pencil. <laughs> Pretty much a stick um, of charcoal at that point. Oh yeah, like 6B. Like, and he gave it to us. He was like, you're gonna animate with that. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you're gonna animate your rough like that. And we're like, why can't we get some blue cut erase like everybody else? He's like, no, 6B pencil. And so we use that to do our rough and try to be precise with a stick of charcoal. Like you can't, there, there's no way. So it was basically as if we were animating uh, like this and it was like, you don't, you can't sharpen it. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, lines got messy and messy and messy, but actually this is, uh, this is actually perfect. Cause if I show you the difference, if you're trying, because rough, the important, the important step of your rough is to try and get the essence of your pose. So by having a very thick pencil, uh, like I can get here, let me get my favorite default brush from the software. It's called pipe cleaner. And I have no idea what a pipe cleaner is and why you're supposed to draw with it. But listen, it looks good. So pipe cleaner it is. So by having a very thick line, you can then very get your gesture going just to get the, 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 big, the biggest of the gesture going. Because that, that's all you need for your rough. You need your, the gesture going on in there. You're looking for some nice curves. And yeah, that's what you're looking for. If you take a super small pencil and you try to rough, sometimes you're gonna get lost into the details and be like, okay, I'm, I'm drawing this, but, but you know, that guy needs a face. And then you start to draw the face with lots of pretty details and eye and eyelashes and you know, and little, and then you look back and you're like, oh, well the face is detailed, but not the body. And then you're like, oh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this more detailed and and then you get lost. So by having a very thick brush and not zooming in, you can actually get the essence of your pose. So you mentioned uh, that during the rough phase, what you're really trying to capture is like the gesture of the drawing. Um, what are some ways that you can pick up skill drawing gestures? You can pick up what? Uh, what are some ways you can practice gesture drawing? Oh, one way to practice gesture drawing is actually to draw looking at things. So um, a good way to look at gesture drawing is actually to, uh, if you can, attend some life drawing sessions when there is somebody that is going to stand on an amazing pedestal because they're amazing and be like taking the poses and be like, draw me. But if you cannot attend these sessions, there's a lot of free websites online uh, in where you can find some good resources of uh, pictures or people making moves and stuff that you can refer to. And the other option that you have that I usually take is I go to YouTube and I just find a video of the subject that I want to look for. And then I, I, I watch the video and I pause it and then I, I draw these poses. 
-hmm. And uh, yeah, so it's it's really practicing drawing from what you see. Um, and the best advice I have for that is do it in a gang, do it with many different people. Because if you do it alone, sometimes you're just going to be stuck in your style. So if you can find some people to do it with online, uh, that could be very fun. Phrasing. Um, after rough animation, there is tie down and cleanup. What are the differences between the tie down and cleanup steps? Um, usually the difference between the, ooh, the tie down and the cleanup is the cleanup, of course, is going to be cleaner than the tie down. So if we look at this here, for example, I have my cape. And this one is very rough. You see the lines are very broad. So sometimes if you give that straight away to a cleanup artist, which you can, like, I mean, some productions will just go from rough to cleanup and that's OK. It's just going to be longer usually, but um, it happens. But usually you're going from rough and then you would go to tie down, which is uh, I'm just going to show you quickly by creating another layer. I'm going to call it the tie down of the cape. Naming your layer is important, children. Um, and when you do that, uh, you want to, uh, you're going to draw. So it's going to be clean ish, like that. Let me just set my average right. So you can, you're, it's going to be clean ish. So it's going to be cleaner than the rough, but it's not going to be clean yet. And by that, what I mean is that the tie down, for example, sometimes will be done with the brush tool still even if the final clean is done with the pencil tool. So I'm going to draw one sh one drawing of the cape in tie down. And after that, I'm going to clean it up while we speak, Mike. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you use uh, the brush and pencil. We, we got a question about whether you use vector graphics or bitmap graphics for, uh, or bitmap, bitmap brushes for these different steps. Um, what are some of the, uh, the, the tools that you use and why are they good at different stages? Um, so in Harmony, I always draw with vector layers just because they give you the most freedom. And I mean, some people are very good at drawing. I'm not. So <laughs> I need to play a lot with my uh, with my lines. And I like to be able to take my line and be like, you know what? Let's just take that and, and move it a little bit. Because I can, because it's vectors and it's so nice. Just be able to adjust your lines like that is something I wished I could have done on paper years ago, but you know, you can't. Um, so I always draw with the vector layers. I have friends who like to draw with bitmap layers, but usually they come from uh, years and years of like paper animation and they kind of know what they're doing. And so they don't need, they don't want to play with fancy toys that vector can allow you to. Uh, but personally, I always draw with vector just because it saves that much time. But like you see here, uh, people us usually think of vectors as these very uh, bland lines that are very opaque, which I, I kind of like them, so I won't criticize them too much. I like to draw in vector as well. Um, because I vector hear it often is described easy. as like ink almost. Yeah, exactly. It's super sharp, super nice, and no matter how you zoom in, it looks gorgeous. Uh, the thing with bitmap is that it looks good, but if I zoom in, eh, you know, less good. But it's the strongest thing you'll get to look like paper, so that's great. Yeah. So typically my and rough, I do them with textures like that, but the cleanup is typically done using the pencil. So, so you mentioned that you use the uh, brush tool and the pencil tool. What are the two different tools good for? Like, why would you want to use the brush tool instead of the pencil tool or the pencil tool instead of the brush tool? So like I like I was saying, the, the brush tool is very nice because it's it's what it's the closest you'll get to drawing on paper. It's very nice, it's loyal to what you draw. But the thing is with the brush, usually feature film will sometimes clean up using the brush, but usually every cleanup is done with the pencil, and I'm gonna explain to you why in a moment. But if you work with the brush, it's amazing, but what you draw is what you get. You can't edit it except maybe like moving your lines a little bit, but that's it. So you have to be sure of what you're doing 100%. Well, if you clean using a pencil, which is what I'm going to show you right now, uh, if I clean using the pencil, uh, like that, 
I'm doing a bit fast, okay, but bear with me. It will be beautiful in the end. <laughs> uh, when you're cleaning with the pencil tool, the great thing is as you clean, if you want to change the size of the line, you can just take it and then you can just you can just change the line. Oh my god! And you can even add texture to it, so like what more do you want? <laughs> it's so cool. Whoa! And it's all procedural, so it's very light on your computer. It's not as heavy as drawing on bitmaps, for example. So it's it's nice. I like it. We have some questions about brushes. Uh, what are some of your favorite brushes to use on the cleanup phase? Uh, so for the cleanup, the only time I had to clean up using the brush um, on an official project, uh, we cleaned using vectors. So it was just a normal vector brush. But for a lot of my personal project, I get to experiment, and that's fun. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite brush to use, like I said, at the moment, it's the pipe cleaner. Maybe in two weeks, it's going to be different. But you know, at the moment, it's the pipe cleaner. I, I love it. If somebody in the chat knows what a pipe cleaner is, let me know. I have no idea. But the texture is very nice. I know that the charcoal brush is also fun, but there's so many brushes to choose from. Uh, if I wasn't as lazy, I would have made my own, but I'm too satisfied with these ones, so I don't have made my own. And when it comes to pencil cleaning, um, when it comes, oops, when it comes to pencil, I made my own, uh, and it's uh, this one. Is it this one? Yes, it's this one. And it's just a texture that I've made for fun, and I like the look of it. It's like, it's kind of like a little bumpy. I like that texture. And I've yeah, I've made it myself on just by drawing a texture. Yeah, uh, I can see that uh, Michael Doeg and India Swift are in the uh, <laughs> the chat telling us what. Uh, pipe cleaners are. So uh, apparently it's a piece of wire wrapped in bristles uh, or a, a fuzzy wire that you can bend however you want. Uh, they used to make like arts and crafts in school. Oh, it's a cute kid. <laughs> so I, I think you can also use them as a brush too uh, in ink. Oh, in French we call them cure pip and I think it's funny. So. Hey, so th th there we go. The stream is educational. It's what I used to clean my recyclable ecological straws. Just saying. Respect in uh, Mar Maria, what do you enjoy most about working on animated projects? Okay, you'll think I'm weird, but what I enjoy most while working on animation project is actually making it. Like, <laughs> I'm the weird person who enjoys making my shot more than watching it after. Um, yeah, for some reason, I, I just love bringing stuff to life. And I, I think that's the truth for other animators as well. Because, you know, you can draw something, but it will never look as alive as if it moves. So I remember being a kid and and just watching and, and just like having these characters in my head and then I would draw them. And I always wanted to make them move, but I was never able until I hit animation school. But uh, yeah, it's just to bring life to things. It's, I don't know, it's one of my favorite things ever. Uh, to do it and then when you show it it's actually when you show it to people and they're like whoa it moves and I don't know it's like it's like being a wizard I, I don't know yeah my favorite part is just sharing that animation with people and, and making it and, and like the, the, the whole process of making it I don't know it just brings everyone together and it's fun yeah and, and you and I have spoken about this before but when did you learn how to animate I learned how to animate from watching The Little Mermaid 2 because the second one is really good, fight me. And I would watch my VHS tapes in my, on my TV and stop them frame by frame and just trace over the TV. <laughs> yes. And then I ended up breaking that VHS from playing and stopping it too much, but that's okay. That was my first thing when I learned to animate and then uh, I discovered animation softwares uh, tried to make them work but oop 
what <laughs> I gotta tag my mate eraser. But where I learned to animate was in a school in Montreal. This is where I truly learned to animate uh, as a trade. It was it's called Cégep du Vieux Montréal, and it's an amazing school in Montreal where you can learn animation. And uh, how much does tuition cost in uh, Quebec? <laughs> so I don't remember, which should be a good sign because it's easy to forget how much how low it was. But I know that it was surprisingly very low. Uh, I think for one, like I went there for five years. And each year you have two sessions, so that's 10 sessions or semester in English, as they called it. And one semester cost, I think, this is the part that P Quebec people might correct me. 10 years ago, CJEP was probably a hundred and at most, 50, I think it was that for a semester. So you have to do that time 10. So that's, oh, you just have to add a zero. <laughs> I'm so smart. So, oh, yeah, so that's the price I probably paid for my studies yeah. for five years. And it, it, it's a really well respected program, too. Like, there are a lot it of is. really great animators that uh, graduate from there, including yourself. Yeah, including lots of people at Tumboom, actually. Yeah. Uh, we got a question from our friend uh, Tony Teach, uh, who's asking Are your animation influences more classic or contemporary? Ooh, that's a nice question. Uh, my animation influences. I think it changes a lot. Um, my animation influences. Hmm. What was the question? If it was modern or what? I forgot the word. Sorry. Yeah, if it's more classic or contemporary. So I, I'm guessing, like, what era of animation influences you? You, you mentioned uh, the Little Mermaid two. So I, I think that was in the <laughs> '90s, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like, do you think that was in the, the, the caps or xerography era? But I think it really depends because I I know one thing that doesn't inspire me. It's the Flesher era with, with the rubber hole thing. You're not a fan of the noodly arms? Well, I'm a, I respect it and I know it's a big part of our history, but it's not something that I enjoy particularly hmm. if I'm... You can you, you can throw rocks at me, but that's OK. Uh, but I really love what we called uh, UPA. I forgot what it stands for. It's oh, yeah, yeah. The, the un is it United? Um... United Universe. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but like, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Where you have like limited animation and like painterly backgrounds. I, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, very. I, what I love is very, very, very uh, silhouette and 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 uh, shapey stuff, you know, like Samurai Jack, or uh, there was a show I loved to watch. It was called Rats. I don't know if anyone, anybody watched that, but it was about rats on a ship stealing cheese and stuff. It was just the blast. I love that so much. So everything that is super, super simple and stylized, that's that's my jam right there. Yeah. But the thing what is that it think? came in multiple oh. eras. So it, it's not a time. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a time yeah. or a style. Huh. What do you think animators can learn from more simple characters? They can learn to, how is it called? I'm losing my English today. They can learn to simplify, shape, use shapes. It's so important. Um, um, yeah, and, and that's also a mistake I see a lot in people starting out in, in animation. Um, they would, um, Actually, I need to animate that, not just in one frame. It's hard to do that as I speak. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah I know it's challenging, <laughs> but it's fun. I like it. Um, but I forgot the question. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, well, I guess the question is like, Sorry. what what do you feel is like really good for animators to study about uh, really simple character designs? Like, what does it let animators do when things are uh, a little bit simpler? It, it, it uh, and actually I just remembered like uh, and it's the same answer is like for uh, it's a big mistake that people usually do is they put way too many details in their characters and when you have too many details and you don't simplify enough it makes for a very stiff animation again because the more details you have in your characters the more you're going to have to redraw them all the time and um, so 
um, yeah, so when you're watching very simplified animation made by other people, for example, you can learn to pick up things from their style and um, and to, to simplify. And while I mentioned this, there's uh, when you were talking about, uh, how is it called, the gesture drawing thing, mm -hmm. one thing I totally forgot, and it's a big mistake I've made for years, so I'm going to warn you so you don't make the same mistake as me. I was told by a certain teacher one day that uh, you should only draw from real life, only draw from pictures and animation drawings are stupid and whatever. That was not a, that was not one of my animation teachers, for by the way, because just saying my, my my program was nice. The teachers were nice. It was another thing completely, and they're like, yeah, you should you should only study from like pictures or model and stuff and don't don't list don't draw other people's drawing because you're going to pick up on what they do wrong which is something maybe people in the chat agree we get told a lot and actually i strongly disagree with that because yes you can be negative person and say that you're going to pick up everything they do wrong but trust me by drawing other people's drawing you're also going to pick up what they do right <laughs> So mm -hmm. you have to just be careful of what you reference and trace because you can look as many pictures as you want. Knowing how to schematize an arm shape, you're not going to learn that from drawing only on the picture. You need to know how other people interpret things. I don't know if that made sense, but I tried. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because w when you study how characters are constructed, you learn how they interpret things. Yeah. The, the, the cartoonists, I mean, not the characters. <laughs> and the thing is that um, we're on stream, so we cannot share reference and stuff made by other people. But um, it's so, like, there's so much things I learned from watching Stephen Silver uh, drawings. Um, I, I'm losing all my names now because my mind is just blanking, but there's so many strong uh, artists that are good at, at doing schematization of simplification actually of lots of uh, shapes and I studying from them is just insane. What would you say that uh, some of your favorite current animated series are? Ooh, um, at the moment, favorite animated series. There's so many. I started watching Avatar again because you know you have to watch that show once a year because <laughs> it's that good. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender definitely is one of my inspiration because they got simpli simplification really good. Um, like I said, Rats is another show that I love. It's like it's written Rats with a, I think it's with a Z at the end. It's really cool. I love that show. Uh, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle is also a very good show to watch if you want to learn about simplification and dynamic poses and animation and whatnot and the other one i'm i'm also watching a lot at the moment is glitch tag because it's that good go watch it it's really cool yeah uh, i know a few people who worked on that one hi <laughs> it's me <laughs> uh mariev uh, we have a question in the chat which is uh who are some of your favorite animators dog and swift <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but I, I uh, yeah, these are amazing. I have so many favorite animators, and actually, lots of them, you might not know them. So I might we we might be able to share some links somehow. Um, of course, for the one that are like everybody knows, of course, there's like James Baxter because he's really amazing and he's very good at at explaining as well. Uh, but in terms of favorite animators. Um, I'm fortunate enough to call a lot of them my friends. Uh, I uh, all the people that take part in the Dorgan Swift animation challenge every week, the the thing you talked about some weeks ago. Um, so there's lots of people online here. These are all people that I look up to. I also have a friend called Sam, Sam, Samuel Kavanagh who worked on Klaus recently. We went to school together and he's a constant inspiration for me because not only is he very talented, he's also super nice and humble and that's something that is super important. So yeah, yeah. there's Samuel, James. Uh, he was working on uh, Green Eggs and Ham, right? Oh yes, yes he is. 
it was is i don't know if it's still running at the moment but yeah uh, i just saw some of the, uh, the, the the samples he posted and they were uh, fantastic uh we got a question in the chat from asaf who uh is asking uh what is a solution specialist uh Mariev, what do you do with us oh boy what do i do with you guys uh, I ask my que I ask myself this question every day, but uh, no, uh, saying that because there's so much things we do. Uh, solution specialists, depending depending on the day, uh, some days I'll be teaching, um, teaching to schools, teaching to uh, studios, um, teaching them about the softwares, about the new technologies, about animation. Um, what I'm not teaching will be developing materials for the learn portal. Uh, where you have the free learning things online. Um, at one, sometimes we also test new features for the software. We provide feedback. Um, I also hang out on Discord a lot, just trying to reach out and seeing what animators need. It's it's a very very broad job. Oh, also, if a studio is having some issues on their production, we also get sent in for a week or two, trying to. Um, make that pipeline smoother and solve whatever issues there might be in the pipeline so uh, we also do consulting for studios so if they if they need some help animating a pilot or making some rigs or if they need help animating we can also jump in so it's it's so much things i think i'm i'm i must be forgetting stuff oh yeah helping yeah. you guys in um <laughs> marketing making amazing twitch events like that Thank you for having me. Yeah. Here. Well, uh, the, the way I think of it is like you guys are like um, really great instructors and also this like specialist team of like animator ninjas who go into studios and uh, fix productions. Uh, so I, I think it's a really cool job. It is. I really love my job. I'm so I'm really happy I have this job. Surprisingly, I thought I would have that job way later in my life that I did. I was like, I was in school, just hoping that I could do this job because one of my teacher actually did this job like 20 or something years ago, maybe more. Uh, no, You've been around years. that long. <laughs> yeah. And, and she told us about that job, like, yeah, we, I would go in studios, help out, make people happy, travel. I'm like, yo, that's a neat job. But she was a bit more exp uh, I wouldn't say older because she's not going to be happy that I say that. More experience than I yeah. was. So it's like maybe like 20 years out of school, I'll be able to do that job. But hey, here I am, not 20 years out of school. And I'm really happy I'm here. So you mentioned that like one of the things you get to do is try out some of the newest features in our software. What are some of the recent features that make uh, cleaning and uh, tie downs easier. Oh my God, there's so many stuff. Uh, first, there is the the onion skin got revamped a few years ago, but that's not really new. That was 16. The shift and trace tool, it's so cool. I cannot use it right now because I don't have enough drawings, but there's a thing where you can just take a drawing and move it. Um, so if I want to, tr if I want to use that drawing and trace over another one, you it's exactly one like when in real life you take two sheets of paper and you put them on top of each other to trace them. But the beautiful thing is that I can do whatever I want with that drawing. But when I wonder, boop, it's going to go back in place. Look, it went back in place. And if I go back in my working view, it's there. So it's a completely non-lethal way to move your frames around to be able to trace over certain parts and clean up and and for the people like me who are very prone to forgetting things if you forget that you did that it's okay it's gonna render just fine because in the past people we would take pegs to do that it would peg your drawing and i can't tell you the number of time i forgot said pegs and then when i exported my animation it was going like whoop -a crazy like that so yeah shift and trace yeah. And the other one that I really love is just how better the drawing interface uh, got with the newest edition of the software. It always just, it never stops getting better. And I think the best thing for hand drawn that they added some years ago was the pen settings. Yes, Harmony has a stabilizer that helps you draw smooth lines. 
And unlike a certain other software, um, that when you draw, uh, the smoothing what happens after you draw and make your line all wanky and stuff. Um, the beautiful thing with a, a real-time stabilizer is that it's going to do it as you draw. So the stabilization happens as you draw. So it's it's just it's just so smooth. It's just so nice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are two different types of stabilizers, if I remember correctly. We have the uh, the normal mode and the pull string mode. Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> Which one do you prefer to use? I just want to finish this line, please. Thank you. Okay, so the one I prefer to use is um, actually it depends. Uh, generally, I like to use average, and I always set it between ten or twenty percent because you know if you set it to hundred, it's kind of counterintuitive. But I like to use average when I'm drawing smooth lines like that cape. But I also like the pull string just because it's so much easier to do very, very sharp lines like that. So, I mean, if I'm drawing a crocodile's head and I want to draw sharp teeth, I would take my pull string just to get something very straight because the average is always going to make them kind of pretty and smooth. So it just depends. Yeah. Uh, another tool that I've heard you mention with the uh, with, with cleanup is the uh, the cutter tool. Oh, I forgot about that. You're right. Where can I use it? I can use it on the hair. So, like I said, it really depends on the style. If I was going for a more geometric style, like I was talking about before, let, let's try that here. I'm gonna get that solid brush. Yeah, that seems good. If I were to clean that. Uh, arm, for example, I could just do see these kind of quick lines like that. Whoop, whoop. And all these things that are overboard here, I could just like take my cutter and fruit ninja these lines away. Whoa. Cool. And yeah. yeah, it's just fun. And is it the bevel setting that um, gets you the uh, the really sharp corners? It is. Let me All right, I learned something. <laughs> it is on drawing. It is. On, it is on the pencil though, because brush and pencils don't work the same way. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you do something like that, no, not with textures. I don't want textures. Thank you. Uh, with your little cutter, with the bevel, you can choose a different style. But this is just for the pencil. I don't think it works for the brush. But yeah, so then once you clean, you can have different types of corners, and it's kind of cool. Yeah, so you could have like a soft corner, a really sharp corner. Yeah, I'm going to zoom in so you can see it. <laughs> Whoa! 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 So one of the questions that we got in the chat is, uh, which edition of Harmony do you use for doing uh, traditional animation? Okay, uh, I use Premium all the time because I love to be able to do my animation from A to Z. So even though I do frame by frame animation, uh, I just love the how the node view works and it's just so much easy to so much easier to what you're doing. So for example, uh, instead because I don't I'm not a fan of the timeline because it gets confusing fast when you have more than like three layers. So I like to be able to use the node view to organize my thoughts uh, better. Because yep. I can say like, this is my sketch, my cape. It, it just works better for me because I'm a very visual person. And uh, yeah, so I love to be able to use the node view to do my kind of stuff and just to take my animation from A to Z uh, with like I know I like how easy it is to just add compositing and be like, I want these things to glow and I'm going to make them glow. And that's how easy it gets, for example, to make your things glow. And yeah, so no matter what type of animation, I'm using Premium all the time. But um, I know that in, in some studios, you can also just run uh, your studio with Harmony Advance because Harmony Advance has all you need to do your frame by frame animation. 
and then if you want to do compositing, you can just do uh, use the uh, uh, compositing department that has the premium license. I guess it depends, but personally, I'm only using premium. Yeah, just yeah. because it's that uh, easy to manipulate everything. And, and what are some of the ways that uh, like the node view can help with traditional animation? Because I, I think a lot of people think of it as a tool more for cutout animation. Yeah, so if I take another scene that I have right here, is it here? It's not. I'm going to open it in a second. Uh, when you have a scene with a multiplane, for example, it's way easier to manipulate all your different layers of multiplanes uh, from the node view like that. And also just to be able to use that uh, to organize your thoughts better. Um, and also if I need to have a character that is clean up and I need to put a certain details only on the cape, for example, just making cutter system. Um, maybe while you ask the other questions, I can do that quickly just to show you what I mean. Um, All right. Well, my... we've got a ton of questions in the chat. One of them is, oh uh, how did you get introduced to Harmony and get a job at Toon Boom? <laughs> so I think there are two questions in there. Uh, for the second one, I, I can say from experience, I, I saw a job posting and I applied and uh, here I am. Um, but when were you first introduced to Harmony? Okay, so <laughs> uh, honestly, one of the, I think one of the reasons why when I teach, it's kind of easy-ish is because I started as an eight-year-old animating on Flash. Like my uncle was a big fan of technology so he had uh, a software he had flash at his home and i was like oh my god that's nice so i started with that software as a kid uh, that was like 20 years ago <laughs> oops <laughs> and um so i used to draw on that software so that's where i started and then i went to school and i was like oh that's gonna be easy i'm gonna learn how to animate on computer again but i already know how to do it and then i went to the class and it was like okay that's hope and harmony i was like what <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, I never heard of that software before. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool. That was 10 years ago. So it's been a while. So uh, I think it was Harmony 9. That was a long time ago. And I just thought it was like when the teacher just opened the node view and was like, you know, you can organize your ideas like that. You can put effects directly on your animation. You don't need to export it and put it in another software. It just blew my mind. I was like, OK. The learning curve was rough for three days. And after that, I was sort of like, that is just so nice. Mm -hmm. And I never really went back after. So I, I got introduced to Harmony in animation school um, because all these years ago, Harmony was, was a, um, it was like, there was not the three editions. It was really more of a studio tool, but now it's becoming so much more uh, widespread. And that's very interesting to see all like I see so many kids now, they're like 12 years old and they know how to animate. I'm like, what? I learned how to animate at like, what, 18 years old or something? I'm jealous. I really am. Yeah. How so I got one of the comments we got, oh. Oh yeah, well, how I got introduced to Toon Boom was just that I had teachers yeah. who worked at Toon Boom and they're like, you, you should go and apply there because even in an animation school, I was helping my friends learning the software, so. So, so you studied animation in Montreal and we're based out of Montreal. Oh, yeah, that, that also helps. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. right next door. Okay, so that, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, one of the comments that we got was, uh, I find the node view so confusing. Are there any online tutorials available demonstrating how to use it for traditional timeline style animation? I could make one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good answer. Um, <laughs> um, is there, I don't, I think, I think, Onion Skin made one actually to like specifically for the node view for frame by frame. And if you look, go to the Toon Boom Learn portal, there is also uh, there's a whole um, how do we call it? a whole journey about learning paperless animation and they do it uh, in Harmony Premium. So they show you how to use the tools. Yeah. I know we also have a tool on uh, organizing the node view so it doesn't look like as much of a spaghetti monster with like, oh, backdrops. Yeah and uh, other tools too. Because if I get, usually when you create your scene, sometimes it's going to look like this, and then you cry and you don't know what's going on with the world. But I mean, you can just do this. Select your little nodes, and then you click that, click click on this align node horizontally and 
Whoa! It's oh, going to get For a second better. there, I was crying and wondering what was going on in the world, and now I feel a lot better. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Where is my cleanup layer? Oh, yeah, I unconnected it. Silly me. Tie down, Kate. Come back Ooh. here. You we know got a big question in the chat. Uh, so someone's wondering, um, th this is a question from an aspiring animator. If they wanted to start their own animation series, what steps do they take? Uh, ooh, if they want to make their own animated series? Going from, from zero to a series. Zero to hero. So, um, so my recommendation would be to start small. Make uh, a very short animation first. That is uh, for and... sure. Because <laughs> oh. like a series is big, right? Like we're talking, uh, if it's just like a TV show, right? That's, that's half an hour uh, at uh, 12 frames per second. Uh, multiply that by uh, a minute and then multiply that by 30. That's a lot of frames. And I think, yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest min misconception. Like we think animation is just drawing, it's just fun. And, and actually it is, it is really fun to, to, to draw and animate. But um, the thing is that it's also very expensive. I got, I got a friend of a friend this week who asked me, yeah, I'm making this cool project. Do you want to make the animation for the uh, opening sequence? I'm like, what's your budget? A hundred dollars. I'm like, no. <laughs> I will not animate a, gym, a, a, a thing for $100 because animation takes so much time to do. And yeah. that's, and for all of you aspiring uh, series creator out there, uh, I would say start small. And, I, and I'm not saying that to discourage you or anything. Um, but like in, instead of starting with uh, an, a whole episode of your project, I'd say start with having a solid boarded uh, sequence and then you can do your animatic. And once you get your animatic and by animatic, I mean, do it a minute long. If you can do a minute and you can catch the interest of someone, I mean, then you can maybe make it longer, but try to get it for a minute. And after that, you can take maybe 10 seconds of that animatic and actually animate it. So start very small. And like I said, I'm not saying that to discourage you, but if you start too big, you're going to be the one who can get discouraged because you're never going to see the end of your project. Like television series, they have dozens and dozens of animators working on them. It's not, it's not, they don't do that alone. It's a very yeah. big teamwork. Script writers, storyboard artists, yeah. uh, animators, cleanup artists, uh, the production can get really big. What has been your favorite role in an animated production? Hmm. I okay, so I was never, and I, I'm not, I'm not throwing a pity party here, okay? But I was never the wonder star animation animator of ev of any show I was on um, ever, and that's okay. Uh, what I loved was taking, uh, like, um, how do we say? It's not, it's not. Is it supervising? It is supervising. So making sure that the project is going in the right direction. So supervising the technical stuff. Um, tech supervisor, perhaps? <laughs> I think the difference between a tech supervisor and a tech director is that the tech director can script and I can't. So I was just overseeing the production and being able to call, you know, that design or that scene that you're trying to do in compositing it might not work this way. You should try it this way. And just making sure that everything runs smooth. That was my favorite uh, job. That was actually what I did last on Glitch Tech. So just making sure that um, the partition was running smooth. And aside from that, I, I love taking care of the juniors. Like if, if we got new, new hire, like throw them to me, I'm going to show them the ropes. I, I just love to take time time with them. And that's actually how I got my job at Toon Boom. I was yeah. helping out on Bigger Rule 6 and taking care of the team and showing them how to animate and how to make the software work and stuff. So that's, that was really fun. So right I know, now I know I'm cheesy the, uh, Right now you're working on the, the, the cleanup phase. Uh, what are some uh, things that can go wrong while you're trying to clean up uh, artwork? Things that, oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> P 
tracing your line art on the color art layer. And if that happens, fear not. You can just take it. Wait, let's say that I put my line art on my color art layer. Oh, and let's say that there was already color because I don't know, this thing can happen. Uh, let's say that he already had colors in his head. And like that, so there was already color. The good, the good thing is that with your select tool, you can click on the select by color and just click on the color of your line art and it's going to select all of your line art at once. So you can cut paste it on your line art layer. Isn't this amazing? Thank you. <laughs> it saved myself a lot of times when I do that. Uh, I think another thing we've, we've talked about before too is like when you're drawing line art and it looks like uh, a line connects and it doesn't and you're trying to fill it later with paint. You're and, reading my uh, mind. I was going to talk about the tangents. Oh my God. Um, like tangents. For some of you who don't know what a tangent is, is that thing over here. So you see in that part, I have a line going. Let me just show you with that layer. OK, so I have this shape, so I could have cleaned it and that's ooh, and that's actually a mistake I see a lot and I use everybody used to do uh, myself included in animation school. Uh, we would draw that arm, for example. I'm drawing on the color art layer. No, <laughs> come back uh, like this. And then I would draw this arm, for example, and I would draw this here. And you see the cape is supposed to connect at the corner. This is a tangent. It's bad because if you look at something, your eyes will go whoosh, looking at this. This is the only thing your eye is going to care about in that scene. And this is because you have too many lines converging at the same place and your eye is trying to understand what's going on there. So tangents are something that happens a lot in cleanup and usually we try to break them by doing something like this. So you have to give space to your lines to breathe. So we always try to have things not being tangents. And sometimes you'll have this arm, for example, that is here. And then in the scene, He's running, I don't know, he's running in a in a kitchen and there's and there is a, a furniture of the kitchen right here. Or a wall and then this thing is going to happen. So you're going to have tangent with the background and this is super annoying because sometimes you clean up your shot and after you bring in the background, you're like, hmm. You know, I need to edit my frames a little bit, but that's OK. You can just do some little edits like that just so that there's no tangents. Tangents are evil. So we're running out of time, but I think there's still, uh, if, if anyone in the audience wants to uh, drop in a couple questions, we might still have time to answer them. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any other tips that you have uh, generally for cleanup? Uh, okay, a tip for cleanup is don't, uh, depending on what, don't try to clean up straight ahead. I think it's really important to uh, clean up with your, uh, you can start with your keys at first. Oops. Clean up your keys at first. And once this is done, oh, I'm doing very quick, but uh, once your keys are done, then you can start to clean in between these keys. And I'd say try not to use the onion skin too much because this is the onion skin is also something that's going to make your animation look stiff. Uh, it's better to flip to know what's going on with your shots. You can flip by pressing F and G, just saying. Uh, so flipping it will help your cleanup uh, more than the onion skin. The onion skin is really more for frames that are really close to each other. Oh. I don't have what settings do you like to use when you flip between um, poses? I like to use the mark drawings and the flip toolbars, which are two toolbars that you can find over here. You can right click and find flip and mark drawing. Hooray! So with mark drawing, you can identify your frames as either keyframes 
breakdowns. And oops. So these are my keyframes and I can do this and then I can see my breakdown as well. So you can flip, for example, only between your breakdowns or between only your keyframes and you can even use the onion skin with these. Uh, you can only on your skin between your keyframes, for example. So I would see my animation going uh, in between my keyframes, which is great. All right. And uh, we also got a question about the line builder tool. Uh, do you have any opinions about the line builder tool and how to use it for cleanup? Oh, I love the line building mode. Let me just get another frame here that I can clean. One that is fun for the line building mode. Yeah, this one is fun. So it, I love to use the line building mode for longer lines because I'm going to try to go as fast as I can there. But if you draw with a pencil tool and you want to draw a long line, either you're, you do a very good line like that or sometimes just to get the pressure in there, it's fun to just sculpt your line. I love I, On paper, I love to sculpt my line. But if I do that and I press K, you're going to have so many points. And these are not closed, so the computer is going to go crazy trying to close them when you use the close gap feature. So what I love to use is the line building mode, which is this thing here, line building. And as you draw, it's going to, it'll, it'll unify your lines. It's just so good. I'm working on a very cool project called Like a Daisy at the moment. It's a short film about a beautiful comic made by the lovely Tracy. And we use that a lot for our cleanup because we clean up using the pencil tool. And this allows us to have a line that is not too artificial, but still looks very great and is very efficient uh, vector wise. Yeah, we recently interviewed uh, Tracy and Fable uh, behind yeah. Black and Daisy cool. on uh, animation from every angle. So if, if you're curious about that, we'll drop a link in the, uh, the show notes. Fable All is right. also an animator I look up to because she's so good. Oh my god. Yeah, they're really so, cool. So good. Uh, so I think we're at the end of uh, this session. So uh, the big question I have for you, Mariev, is where can viewers go to see more of your work? <laughs> they can go to uh, YouTube because I have a YouTube channel full of tutorials and videos that they can check out. Find I, actually they can find me anywhere with that name. I'm gonna write it. If you if you if you look on Twitter and Instagram on YouTube, I think that's it. I only have these, but that's more than enough. You can just find a Z bird brain because that's my screen name. Because my real name is Mary Eve, and if you're not French or you're trying to say that name. It always sounds a bit weird, so you know, if you if, if you can find a name that sounds better in English, do it. <laughs> so uh, Mariev also contributed to rigs and designs that are in the Harmony Fundamentals training course. We have a new story on the blog about the Harmony Fundamentals course at blog.toonboom.com. And if you're interested in getting training with an instructor, you can register at toonboom.com/training. Next week, we'll be speaking with KB Lee about a really cool rig, and you won't want to miss it. Until next time. Oh, that'll be fun. I'll be sure to be there. That's for sure. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm.